All right, folks, so today we're going to start our section on human sexuality. Um, this lecture is primarily going to discuss sexual orientation, uh, but I'm going to leave in the description below, I'm going to leave some videos to, uh, to describe some of the other aspects of human sexuality that aren't going to be covered uh, in this video. Mostly that has to do with uh, kind of the physiological functioning of sexuality, uh, both male and female anatomy, that type of thing. Uh, usually I would cover that uh, in a lecture, but that uses a lot of diagrams and this sort of thing. So uh, I found a good video that's uh, sort of fun, <laughs> uh, but also does a good job of describing uh, those different phases uh, of sexuality that we'd be talking about in class. Um, but today, what we're mostly going to be talking about again is sexual orientation. So <clears throat> first, I'd like you to take a look at this image. How many colors do you see here? Now, if you were raised in the United States, you will probably say uh, that you see seven colors here. Uh, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Unless, of course, you were raised in another part of the United States, and you might just say uh, that you see six colors here uh, for getting indigo. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. The purpose of this <clears throat> is to think about the fact that color actually represents something that we call a social construct. Now, color is a social construct because it doesn't really have any true boundaries. It doesn't really have any distinction between, uh, say, orange and yellow, or orange and red, right? So where does orange-red start, or where does red end and orange-red begin, right? We have all of these different names for some of these colors, but when you really think about it, those distinctions are really just things that we make up uh, for, for comfort, for ease of talking about, for descriptive purposes, but they don't really exist. There really is no boundary between orange and red. There is distance, but not a true boundary. So this idea of a social construct is something <clears throat> that we do a lot of uh, in, in, in society. So things like temperature, uh, things like race, which we discussed in the previous lecture, uh, and also things like gender roles. So gender roles being distinct from, say, sex, true sex, biological sex, uh, male or female, gender being masculine or feminine, right? So those things are all uh, examples of things that are socially constructed, right? Things that we just decide, we're just going to put a boundary here, right? Temperature, what's the real difference between 86 degrees and 87 degrees? And who decided where that line goes? Well, somebody did and, and they put it there. Also things like time, right? What's the difference between 7 uh, and 7.15 or 7 and 7.01? Uh, really, somebody just decided, well, this is what we'll call 7 o'clock, uh, and the minute after we'll call it 701. So all of these are, are social constructs, and this is something that we can compare uh, to what we would call a taxonomy. And taxonomy are things that have true boundaries between them, things that are actually distinct one from another. So if you think of something uh, like a chemical element, if you think of something like a biological species, a uh, heavenly body, so like a planet, right? The moon is truly distinct from the earth. There is a boundary between uh, those two heavenly bodies, between earth and Mars, and Mars and, I don't know, Jupiter is next, maybe Saturn uh, is next, but right, those things are really distinct from each other. Um, a helium atom is truly distinct from the next atom over uh, on, on the periodic table, the, the hydrogen atom. Those are two totally different things. If you pick up a helium atom, it's always gonna look the same as very distinct from a hydrogen atom. Uh, so the difference between the taxonomy, right, things that are truly distinct and have these boundaries between each other, and a social construct is where we're gonna pick up this conversation about sexuality or sexual orientation in this case. Uh, is sexual orientation, here's our question, uh, is sexual orientation a taxonomy or is sexual orientation uh, a social construct? That is to say, uh, do these boundaries truly exist or do these boundaries exist because it's convenient for us to have such boundaries? Uh, but first, uh, let's figure out what we're talking about. So what is sexual orientation? <laughs> but first, let's figure out what we're not talking about. 
sexual orientation is not sex, where sex refers to a person's biological status as male, female, or intersex. Uh, so sex, I tend to think, and uh, some people might argue with me, but I tend to think of sex as a taxonomy, right? If we're thinking about is sex a type of taxonomy uh, or a social construct, sex seems to be a true taxonomy, right? We can boil that down to an XX chromosome or an XY chromosome in the vast majority uh, of cases so that we can have this true distinction uh, despite appearance, for instance. Uh, sexual orientation is also not gender, where gender refers to the attitudes feelings and behaviors that are associated with each biological sex. So the attitudes, feelings, and behaviors associated with being male, we tend to call masculine, right? That's gender. The male isn't the gender, the masculine, right? Men do this, men do that, right? That's gender. Uh, versus what women tend to do, right? That's um, feminine behavior and that's uh, the female gender for talking about those uh, gender roles. Um, sex also, sexual orientation does also not refer to sexual identity, uh, where sexual identity refers to how one defines themselves with regard to their sexual orientation. Uh, so uh, we know that sexual orientation and sexual identity aren't the same thing. I mean, sexual identity is referring to sexual orientation. Uh, but they're not the same thing because a person can call themselves whatever they want, right? A, uh, a gay person could not be out of the closet yet and call themselves straight. Uh, that's their sexual identity, and yet uh, their sexual orientation would actually be gay, right? The people that they are associated with or the people they're associated with, the people they're attracted to, uh, the people that they would prefer to have romantic relationships. Not to say that that's a taxonomy, but for this uh, example, uh, we're going to use the convenient uh, language. Uh, we also know that sexual identity uh, is not the same as sexual orientation. There was a study that was done that looked at a clinic uh, in New York. This is one of these free uh, STD testing clinics. Uh, and the reason you can go to these clinics to get free STD testing tends to be uh, because they're doing some type of research on you. Now, they're not taking your name or anything like that, but they are just counting uh, how many people come in, how many people come in and test positive for this disease, how many people come in and, and test negative for this disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so uh, because they're doing that, they can often report what they find. Now, some of the things that they can also ask uh, that you wouldn't necessarily report to your doctor um, are just how you sexually identify, how many people you're having sex with uh, on a basis that is something you should probably uh, tell to your doctor. And so this particular study found that 79% uh, of the men that came in that identified themselves as heterosexual actually admitted to having sex with other men. And so this isn't a true you know, display of how many uh, self-identified heterosexual men uh, are having uh, sexual interactions with other men, uh, but it does just illustrate uh, that, that sexual identity and sexual orientation are not the same thing. Uh, the reason it doesn't, this isn't a, a true test of what percentage um, straight men would have you know, sexual relations with other men is because this is a special population, right? Who's going to get tested uh, at an STD clinic? Who's going to get tested at a free ST, uh, STD clinic where you don't have to uh, give your name? It doesn't get reported on your medical record, right? So that's a special segment of the population. But again, it does just reveal that sexual orientation and sexual identity uh, are distinct constructs, right? Those are separate things. So what is uh, sexual orientation? Well, sexual orientation refers to an individual's actual sexual roman and romantic behaviors, fantasies, and attractions towards one or both sexes. So this isn't about what you call yourself, this is about what you actually feel, what you actually do, what you actually uh, love in a romantic way, right? So uh, this is the distinction between that identity piece and an orientation piece. What's really going on is what we're asking uh, with regard to sexual orientation. So 
Uh, back to our question, is sexual orientation uh, a taxonomy or is it more of a social construct? So one way that we can begin to try to figure this out, much in the way that I was talking about sex being uh, a true dichotomy or a true taxonomy, um, is that we can look at the genes, we can look at this biological piece and say, oh, here's a true division, here's a true difference between male and female. And so uh, we feel a little bit safer calling that a taxonomy uh, than we do yet calling uh, sexual orientation one uh, until we maybe look at the biology. So what types of studies have been done to examine uh, what's going on? What makes sexual orientation? What makes uh, people have varied sexual orientations? Or uh, the way researchers tend to ask it is what makes people gay? So uh, in the 90s, we had a real fascination uh, with this. This probably had to do with uh, the AIDS uh, epidemic going on at the time, right? This was just coming out of the 80s, and so now research is catching up and trying to figure out <clears throat> uh, what's going on with that. But also now that, uh, that uh, gay folks are in the population more, or at least more, not, not in the population more, but uh, they're more visible in the population, though in somewhat of a negative way at the time, um, scientists begun to try to understand this psychologically. So the place that we were gonna start, and this was also a big deal in the 90s, was uh, doing genetic research. So what can the genes tell us uh, about the differences between sexual orientation? Well, in 1993, uh, a researcher by the name of Francis Hammer uh, did a study and he found that uh, gay men in particular, it's interesting that these studies tended to focus on gay men, by the way, you'll see that here. He found uh, that gay men had a particular marker on an X chromosome that seemed to be more common uh, among folks who identified as gay. Well, uh, unfortunately, this study could not be replicated. So he, he found this and it was kind of a big deal, it was a big paper. Uh, and then, you know, other scientists, as you do with science, tried to replicate, tried to find the same uh, significant difference, uh, and they couldn't. Uh, this, this study uh, is thus deemed inconclusive, right, because we had this one finding uh, that couldn't be replicated, right, similar to some of the stuff we were talking about back into the science section. Uh, science needs to be replicable, uh, and when it fails to replicate, we have to call those results into question. Uh, so another way to get at the genes is to maybe just look at twins, right? Twins are supposed to, identical twins at least, share 100% of their DNA, of their genetic material. And so uh, if genes are responsible for sexual orientation, what we should see is that if one twin is gay, uh, identical twin is gay, the other twin, the other identical twin uh, should be gay 100%, 100% uh, of the time. However, uh, what we find with what we call uh, concordance studies, and concordance studies are just studies of twins, what we find in these concordance studies uh, is that twins, an identical twin, is about 50% likely to be gay if his brother is gay. Now, this is strange because 50 is a pretty high number. If, this, if these weren't genes, if this were just like, uh, hey, if you um, ate cereal in the morning as a kid, you're 50% uh, percent likely to be gay. Well, that you know, whoa, that's a big deal. But with genes, that that's not a big enough deal, right? If, if we're looking at twins, we would expect that 100% agreement, uh, but we can't find that. We find this 50% uh, percent agreement, which leaves us in this strange realm, right? Zero or even 10% would say uh, that's about what we'd expect to see in the population. In fact, uh, when you just look at non-twin brothers, uh, you do tend to see that there's about a 10% chance, right? If you have one brother uh, that's gay or one sister, in fact, that's gay, there's about a 10% chance that another one of the siblings will be gay. But that is also just the chance that a person is gay in the broader population. So that's no real uh, difference there. Um, if you're wondering about fraternal twins, uh, it was somewhere between that 10 and 50. 50% uh, number, so uh, fraternal twins were about 25% uh, percent likely, 20, excuse me, uh, percent likely to be gay if the other brother or sister, uh, brother in this case in this study, uh, was gay.
So that leaves us in a real place, in, in a weird place, right? Here's another in inconclusive study with regard to genes and sexual orientation. Uh, and so that's about as, as far as we got in terms of genes, right? Those were the only two studies that found anything at all, and then they were not able to be replicated. So that leaves us again uh, in this rather strange place. So although we weren't able to find uh, any genetic markers that were, were truly able to indicate sexual orientation, uh, there was one other study that was biology related back in the 90s uh, that did find uh, something biological. And that was a study by a guy named Levey in 1991 who found that the hypothalamus in the brains of gay men, of the gay men that he researched was smaller, significantly smaller, uh, than that of a straight men. And, and I should correct myself, it wasn't the whole hypothalamus, it was just a little bundle of nerves within the hypothalamus. Uh, but if you remember, the hypothalamus is the seat of emotions, we called it that when we were looking at biology, that the hypothalamus is the place that really regulates all of the emotions uh, within a person, including kind of the feeling of love or romance or even lust, right? Those feelings are gonna be regulated by uh, the hypothalamus. And so it is the place, it is a good place to look if you're looking for somewhere in the brain where sexual uh, orientation may be expressing itself. Uh, however, uh, this study also had some problems. So um, although he was able to find that the, the bundles of nerves within the hypothalamus of the gay men was smaller than that of those of straight men, uh, and, and that difference, by the way, is uh, also a difference we would see between men and women, where men's, uh, that bundle of nerves in uh, men's hypothalamus is larger than it is in women's. Uh, that he found that gay men were somewhere in between uh, those two sizes. Well, this study also was not able to be replicated. Uh, but what's what's more concerning, perhaps, about the study, um, not in a you know in, in an ethical way, but just in a methodological way, um, is that the, all of the gay men that he used had died of AIDS. So he was looking at the hypothalamus, uh, not through some type of brain scan or MRI, he was looking at the hypothalamus as a post-mortem uh, by cutting you know, their, into their brain to kind of measure and weigh these things. And so all of the, the gay men that had volunteered for this study uh, had died of HIV and AIDS, where um, most of the straight men in the study had not. And so here we also have this kind of confound that we don't know if that was some function of the disease or if that uh, truly was some function of uh, sexual orientation expressing itself. So uh, there's a confound with regard to this study, both uh, with the fact that it can't uh, be replicated, hasn't been replicated since. So all of these 1990 studies uh, tended to be inconclusive, long story short. They weren't really able to find any true differences between uh, the, the biological markers and the genetic markers uh, between uh, men who identified as gay and men who identified as straight. And again, I am saying men because these studies in the 90s were really just looking uh, at men. Um, so flash forward to about 2010, and there's a study done in Sweden. Now, I don't know what's going on in Sweden, but uh, somehow in Sweden, I guess if you're a twin, you have to do research because this study in 2010 has uh, 7,600 pairs uh, of twins, and this is apparently all of the eligible twins uh, in Sweden, so uh, twin pairs. So it's actually, you know, 15,000 something, but uh, 7,600 twin pairs uh, in this study. So it was a really big study, and um, they found the most compelling evidence so far. And here, by the way, is where I would put my money if I'm looking at if uh, where sexual orientation comes from. <clears throat> so what they found was that there are three different things that seem to impact sexual orientation. Uh, genetic markers play a role. Uh, for men, they, pet, they play about a 34 to 39% role. So 34 to 39% of sexual orientation seems to be due to genes within men, and 18 to 19% of sexual orientation in women seems to be due to genes. 
This is interesting just to start off with because this is exactly what these twin concordance studies are finding. Now, they're not finding all the way up to 50%, but they're finding this kind of middle range uh, of genetic uh, influence, right? And not a full 100%, but somewhere between 30 and 50 uh, to, to maybe even 60 in some of the concordance studies, uh, right? So somewhere in that middle range we're seeing, uh, that's, that's what the influence, the genetic influence is. So also interesting, right, is that distinction between men and women, right? Men seem to have more of a genetic influence or sexual orientation uh, seems to be more influenced by genetics in men than it does uh, in women. So the other thing they looked at was uh, what, what they call shared environment. Um, now this is a really strange label for what they're actually looking at. A uh, shared environment actually refers to the distinct environment of the individual, right? So the environment that they grew up in, what their family raising was like, the historical experiences they've gone through uh, throughout their life, uh, you know, what type of culture they grew up in. All of these things are what they're calling shared environment. What the individual specific environment actually refers to is the in vitro environment. That is to say, the environment in the womb. Now, this is where they found the most play, and I think this is the most compelling uh, piece of their study, which suggests that it's not quite genes uh, that are making sexual orientation vary, but it is something that's happening before the child is born. It's something that's happening in the womb with regard to hormones. So what they have found, what the research suggests, is that there's something that happens to a woman's body when she's trying to make a boy uh, baby. Uh, she has to release male hormones, androgens, in order to masculinize the boy, in, in order to make him uh, gendered or sexed male. Right? The, these things have to be expressed. And so uh, when she does that, her own body does not want those androgens, those testosterones. Her own body does not want those, those hormones. Uh, and so it's forming sort of this protective wall uh, of hormones around the womb that we call anti-androgens, right? And they just kind of protect the female body from the masculinization process that she's um, inflicting on, on her soon-to-be son. Well, it turns out that the, the mixture of these androgens and anti-androgens seem to have a lot of responsibility for how sexual orientation gets expressed. One strange finding, not connected to this study, but um, that helps describe what maybe is going on in this study, was that uh, if you take, uh, well first of all, the youngest son in a series of sons is the most likely to be gay. Uh, so if you have a son and he's got eight older brothers and no sisters, uh, he's the kid that's most likely to be gay uh, amongst the brothers, just statistically. Now that may not be the case, but just statistically uh, that is the case. So why does that happen? Well, it turns out that as the mother has more and more sons, her body gets better and better at both producing male hormones and producing the anti-androgen hormone. And so she's like just getting good at that. And so she's producing a lot more of, the, of both of those hormones. And it seems to be the ramping up of that mixture again that really seems to be uh, affecting sexual orientation. So this study was one of the first to kind of connect those different dots. Um, one other little study that also highlights this is if you look at animals that have like litters, you know, that have like eight, ten, you know, uh, babies at a time, uh, if all of those babies are boys, uh, the, 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 the boy in the middle, in the, in the midst of all of the boys will be the one uh, most likely to be gay. Again, because he's getting the, all of the androgens from uh, all of the other um, uh, brothers that he's got in the womb, right? So he's getting fed on all of those androgens and again, all of those anti-androgens. And so what you can see is that this <clears throat> this is the uh, the one that will tend to be gay. And when I say gay in terms of an animal, they will exhibit homosexual behavior. We don't know how they identify. <clears throat> uh, but just back up to that shared environment. Something interesting here uh, is that the shared environment 
seems to have very little influence uh, for men. So the the experiences that a man has seem to not to be able to to change or sway his sexual orientation uh, very much, right? It really it seems to be more of this either genetic or this prenatal piece that's affecting male sexual orientation. Whereas for women, we see that experience does seem to have some effect on their sexual orientation. And this is something that had been, has been floating around in kind of popular culture for a while, right? This idea that uh, a woman could be abused, uh, you know, sorry for mentioning, but just that a woman could be abused, for instance, and decide, listen, I'm done with men and mean it, right? But that a man would rarely do that, right? If he says, I'm done with men, and he usually just means he's gonna be a bachelor, right? Uh, so. Um, this is just one of the studies, the most recent study, uh, that was able to find some, some real data um, on sexual orientation. Now, a study of this scale, um, again, 7,600 pairs of, of Swedish twins, um, hasn't been replicated yet to my knowledge. It has been 10 years, so um, <clears throat> maybe someone's done something smaller, but uh, really that's kind of the coup de grace as far as we've gotten in terms of understanding where does sexual orientation come from? Okay, so back to our question. Is sexual orientation the social construct or a taxonomy? Now, to answer this question, we need one more piece of the puzzle. Uh, this piece of the puzzle is looking at how does sexual orientation express itself? Well, we used to think that sexual orientation expressed itself really just in terms of are you gay or are you straight, right? Are you way over here uh, or are you way over here? Uh, but the research of a guy named Alfred Kinsey back in the 50s uh, showed us that really if you go around and you just ask lots and lots and lots and lots of people, what you'll eventually figure out is that sexuality really exists on a gradient. You've got some folks who are way over here in terms of being exclusively in uh, to the opposite sex and that's it, <laughs> end of question. And you've got some folks over here that would say the same thing about the same sex and all sprinkled uh, between them are just lots and lots of different people who prefer a little bit of this and uh, or a little bit of that. And so uh, Kinsey came up with a scale that he, that is now called the Kinsey scale, where he put sexual orientation on a seven point grid going from zero to six, where zero uh, represents exclusively straight, only into, you know, the opposite sex, and uh, seven, excuse me, six represents exclusively gay, only into the same sex. And so uh, you've got one, which is mostly heterosexual, but incidentally uh, homosexual. You've got two, which is mostly heterosexual, but occasionally heterosexual. You've got three that's equally homosexual, heterosexual, uh, and then uh, vice versa down the other end. So uh, this was a, a pretty you know, new revelation in the 50s, right? If you can imagine back in a time uh, when folks were, you know, really just not even interested in talking about sex, uh, or so we thought, uh, that, that this to come out, that sexual orientation uh, isn't something that exists the way that we think it does, was somewhat groundbreaking. Uh, but even still today, uh, we do tend to think of sexual orientation in the way of this kind of uh, taxonomy. So that's what this talk is about. Um, the next person to come along to really try to break sexual orientation in terms of how it's represented in society uh, was a guy named uh, Klein. And he came up with a scale that was trying to challenge Kinsey's scale in a way. Uh, what he said was that Kinsey's scale was just a little bit too linear, that sexual orientation isn't one thing, that it really is all of these different things. It's not just uh, who you sleep with, it's also who you're attracted to and uh, who you have romantic feelings for. And, the, and for Klein, it was the social company that you prefer to keep, right? All of these different things, how you identify is also uh, a piece of sexual orientation uh, for Klein. And so he came up with a scale that separates sexual orientation both on a gradient, right? So from zero to six, but also 
uh, you could think about that on different levels. So from zero to six, where are you on romantic attraction? From zero to six, where are you on sexual attraction? Uh, and so on. Uh, Francis Klein uh, also looked at whether or not these things would change over time. Is this something that's stagnant or can we look at a person's life and see that their romantic attractions will change and that they may change differently than their sexual behaviors uh, and their sexual identity, etc. And so um, he found that this tended to be true and so uh, Klein really kind of busted open the idea of sexual orientation and, and to having folks think about the fact that it's really just not this one thing, right? That when we talk about sexual orientation, it's really a really big thing. Um, and so you have to really think about it in these segmented ways. Uh, however, the most recent research uh, even challenges Klein's conception uh, of sexual orientation. And it wants to understand why sexual orientation at all has to e exist on a continuum that if you go more uh, straight that you necessarily have to go less gay. We used to think this way, for instance, about gender, right? That if you're more masculine, you're necessarily less feminine and vice versa. Uh, but back in the 80s, uh, someone named Sandra Bem came along and she said uh, that we really need to measure these things separately, right? If being masculine means being assertive and uh, dominant and uh, aggressive and take charge uh, and being feminine means uh, being nurturing and being uh, caring and uh, being loving, right? And there's no reason a person can't be both assertive and nurturing or loving and aggressive, right? That, that a person can be both of these things. And so really the question comes down to uh, how masculine are you and how feminine are you? And so sexual orientation took a look at that and in 2001, a guy named Randall Sell uh, made a scale that looks at sexual orientation uh, in this way. How attracted to men are you? What uh, type of behaviors have you had with men? And how romantically are attracted to men are you? And how much uh, sexual uh, attraction do you have to women? What behaviors have you had with them? And what romantic attraction do you have to them, right? That you can answer both of those questions separately and get a model of sexual orientation uh, that's actually really inclusive. For instance, if you don't include this both uh, asking men and women question, what you end up getting uh, is uh, if someone is, say, asexual, that's a person who doesn't really have um, interest in sexuality at all in terms of romantic or sexual uh, attraction or relationships, um, well, where would they fit on something like a Kinsey scale? Well, well they'd fit somewhere in the middle, right? I'm, I'm equally not attracted to men and I'm equally not attracted uh, to women. And so they would end up being in the same place that a person who says, well, I'm bisexual, uh, where do I go? Well, they go in the same spot as the asexual person. But if you ask this question in such a way where you say, how attracted to this sex are you? And how attracted to this sex are you? You can say, I'm attracted to neither of them. And now we have this place in this model for asexuals. And we also have a place in the model for uh, not just bisexuality, but a variety of bisexualities that uh, include the differences that uh, Klein and Kinsey were thinking about.